Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD for October 16th, 2019. I'm your host, Arisha Paris, and with me today is Andrew Horowitz, president of Horowitz & Company and also the host of the Disciplined Investor podcast. Thanks for being here, Andrew. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about the current market, why you don't want to get ahead of a trade, and then we will end the episode with three current stocks. So let's get into the current market. Right now, the uptrend has resumed, but we have six distribution days on the NASDAQ and seven on the S&P 500. It continues to be a choppy market, but good news is the indexes are above the 50-day moving average, and they're holding that strong move that we had on Friday. So continues to be resilient during all this news driven events going on Andrew what, what's your what's your thoughts on the market I mean it is it's like uh, walking through a minefield yes because uh, it seems that the tape is really reacting to a lot of this news on a continual basis and it's waiting for just one more hope hope that a resolution for something to happen with brexit yep hope for something to happen with regard to uh, you know the, the the trade deal, hope that something's going to happen with regard to um, you know just other items that are in fact uh, you know going to resolve. And and the problem is that I see right now is that it all has to fall in place. Hope that earnings are going to be a lot better than they anticipated they're going to be. Hope that the Fed. So this hope trade is alive and well. Yeah. My concern, like I said, is that you know if it doesn't, are people going to get very disillusioned and concerned about it and just say, yeah, the hell with this. Yeah. Now, the the interesting thing, and, and I totally agree with you on, on all of those points, I, I it, it almost seems like the market has had so, plenty of time <sighs> or plenty of opportunities, right? Oh, yeah. To yep. sell off and, and finally get like a 10% correction here. But every time you think it's going to happen, Suddenly, there's a magical floor. There, there are buyers coming up, pushing it up, and it continues to be in the, in this trading range. Well, I think there's a lot of market mechanics that are going along with this. You know, you have things like more people than ever really on the payrolls in the U.S. And what happens when people are on the payrolls? What you get is that they're uh, continuing to invest because they're doing it systematically. A little bit of money is coming out of their paychecks on a regular basis, and that is going where? Into their 401k plan. So you have that going on. Okay. You have the continual rotation and rebalancing by things like robo-advisors that are holding a pretty good amount of cash. So anytime the markets come down, what ends up happening is very simply it gets rotated back from, let's say, bonds or other asset classes back into the stocks. And then finally, we have buybacks. I mean, buybacks are obviously holding up a lot. And then- if all else fails, the good news is the Fed's got our backs. That's that's true. That and then they, right? yeah, yeah, and they always say don't bet against the Fed, right? Yep, that's correct. And 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 really with the fact that the interest rates are just continue to be insanely low, it's hard to to bet against anything because in the end, stock market is is one of the few places where people can actually have a chance at generating some returns. Yep, and the dividend rate on the stock market right now in general, is high enough to say, well, do I want to be in a risk-free asset at a much lower rate, or am I, am I willing to take a little bit more of a risk and invest in just the general stock market and get 2.5% yield? Right, right. So, Andrew, let's get into how you got started in the industry. You have you have been around for a while. You've been doing this for, for many, many years now and survived the I always like to look at it, <laughs> surviving the markets, right? Uh, so, right. so why don't you walk us through your story of how, how you got into this crazy world? So Old Man River here started back <laughs> in the 80s, okay? And uh, so um, I, was, I was back in the 80s. I was, I was kind of uh, thinking about, hey, I want to be involved in the financial services industry. And back then, there was only a couple different avenues to go. So I chose to go into the insurance side of the equation rather okay. than the wirehouse and broker's house because I get all this training and all these great things, quickly found out it wasn't for me. I didn't want to be involved in the insurance commission-based business. Came down to Florida in 87. And 87 made some really good people down here. We were doing fee-based planning the best we could at the time with the tools that we had. Yeah. And uh, utilizing a lot of mutual funds. There really weren't that many or really any ETFs at the time. And it was a kind of split between commissions and uh, fees. Okay. And I always felt that, you know what, the commissions are starting to really be a problem because I can't make good decisions for clients. I can't change things. I can't update things without worrying about whether they're going to be charged another commission for something. And I didn't want to be involved in something that was a bias. 
So fast forward to the 90s, uh, early part of the 90s. Now, now Andrew, and, you, you were really, with the whole commission thing, you were really way ahead of your time then uh, on, on that part. Right, right. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, it just seemed like it wasn't a fair playing field for myself and to make unbiased judgments for my clients. Yeah. So I turned the business over. It was a little painful for about a year or so because what happens is when you're doing that and when you're involved in that, what happens is that your commission revenue has to turn into fee revenue and it has to get to that equilibrium point where you can live. Yeah. But I figured it was early enough in my career. It's not a problem. So fast forward a little bit. Um, I started doing fee-based, but with fee-only investment advisory. So fee for uh, financial planning, fee for estate planning, things of that nature. I am a CFP. And then it got more and more into the investment side of things. Fast forward into uh, the 2000s, and we were continuing doing this. Wrote a book called The Disciplined Investor, Invest, uh, in Essential Strategies for Success. And my publisher said, hey, why don't you do a podcast? Now, this is back in 2007. Yeah. And I'm like- Wait, what, we must have been a, one of the first financial yeah, podcasts pod out there. Yeah. Yeah. What's a podcast? <laughs> what are you talking about? What are you, yeah. You get yourself a microphone. You get yourself this. You put it in this whole uh, RSS feed thing. And I'm like, OK. So we started back in March of 2007 with the first episode of The Discipline Investor. I was pretty much the only financial podcast out there and quickly you know, went up the ranks of iTunes. It was pretty much the only place to put your podcast at the time. Yeah. And fast forward, it really turned out well. Helped book sales. It introduced me to incredible amounts of talent because I had guests on every show. And what happened was I was learning as my listeners were learning. Great platform. And uh, then I was invited on uh, the MSN Money Central Stock Picking Challenge back in 2008. And that was great because I was – Short, going short, I was going long. I was really worried about markets at the time. I was uh, against four or five different investment advisors as well. They finished down 30, 20, 40 percent. I finished up 15 percent, took the prize. And from there, it's been just uh, an ongoing process of refining what we do, expanding the strategies, and uh, have another podcast, wrote another book. It's been a lot of fun. That's amazing. Now, in 2008, what were you seeing uh, with that? Uh, versus all the other competitors in that investment challenge? Were you, were you seeing just the charts themselves? They're just looking very bearish, or were you seeing some other financial kind of indicators? So back in 2006, I had this moment. I could see it as clear as day right now. I was standing on the lawn of a second home that I owned, and uh, I got a call from my sister, and she said you know, she was taking another X amount of dollars out of her house because the value went up so much. I said, wait a minute. You can't afford the base mortgage. What are you doing? Fast forward a little bit, another chunk of money came out. She told me, that's great. I said, this is not good. I started looking around at everybody buying secondary houses. Wow. Every time I talked to somebody, it was all about real estate and flipping real estate. And in 2006, 2007, I got hysterical. I was like on the top of desks screaming, get out of real estate. We're not getting anywhere near this. Market's going to have a problem. I looked at the banks. The banks were a problem. So we saw the whole fundamental backdrop. Wow. Wow. And then it, then it turned into the, cap, uh, into the, st in the stock charts, right? Yeah. It was it was first really a this very clear moment in my life where I just saw this with perfect clarity and uh, said that, you know, we're not doing this. We took client money out of the market, saved a lot of money from being lost for clients. Yeah. And um, it was it was a really interesting time. But it was very clear at the time that banks were having a lot of problem, too much leverage in the system, uh, a lot of lying going on in terms of the the, the, the ability for them to pay. Um, the amount of uh, struggles that we saw, just everything was lining up perfectly for a major problem. Did I, re did I think it was going to be as deep? No. I mean, I had Larry Kudlow on my show. He was saying no recession possible. Yeah. Michael Santoli and I had a big fight. He said, you know, there's going to be uh, no way you're going to see 8% uh, unemployment. I said, 8%? I think we're going to 10. And uh, I was kind of being pushed around a bit and in, in my mind by other people's opinions but I think that it was, if you really step back and think about it, it was pretty clear what was going on. Right. And and what you picked up on is a really important concept, I think, that everyone can learn. Uh, when you start seeing normal people really getting hysterical about investments, a particular type of investment, the real estate in 2007, 2006, or the dot-coms in, in 2000, mm -hmm. right? That's where you know the, the antennas need to go up and say, wait a minute. If everyone's involved in this, 
uh, you got to be very, very careful, that crowded trade concept. Right. The same thing happened with Bitcoin. Yes. I decided yes. to finally buy some Bitcoin and various other cryptos. I made some money. I was out to dinner. I asked the valet to get my car. They were all huddled around on their smartphones to say, hey, what, what are you guys doing? Uh, we're checking our Bitcoin. We're tra I'm, you're trading Bitcoin on your smartphone while you're doing a valet parking job? Oh my God. I said, okay. <laughs> Went right then and there and just closed everything out. Wait, what, what price was it at that point? Uh, I think it was probably close to about 14000 at okay. that point. Yeah, that, that was pretty good because I remember at that once it was just started going that vertical. And, and w mm -hmm. when family members, once family members start oh, asking you, hey, should I get into oh, Bitcoin? Yeah. Right? That, that, that's yep. another thing. Though. Be, be afraid. Be very, very afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. So, Andrew, let's talk a little bit about your your strategies that that you use at the the firm right there. You're, you're in the traditional investments, but what other types of uh, strategies are you using to to uh, really generate a, a good return? So, one of the things we do is so. Uh, let me give you some backdrop on yes. something. When I far, first started working on the whole idea of okay, where do I want to grab my information from? This is pre-internet. Uh, well, I read. A variety of periodicals, IBD being a major influence on uh, how I would pick stocks, the idea of looking at fundamentals and looking at the chart and the technicals together. And of course, followed along a lot of those basic tenets, looking for growth, looking for consistency of earnings, looking for consistency of revenues, high ROE, looking at you know expanding margins, all those things that you well know about, right? right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, and I, I took and maybe stole a little bit of the ideas. <laughs> over time from you, pieced together a few things that I wanted to look at as well, developed a quantitative, fundamental, and technical strategy that I was able to then refine down to a strategy where we have core positions in a, we have a kind of a long, short strategy, um, and it's called the TDI Managed Growth Strategy. Okay. Essentially, it's not necessarily a traditional strategy, it's not long only, it's used as a diversifier, a style diversifier, something that is not exactly correlated with markets. We have a core positioning of equities that will expand or contract dependent on how many names come through the actual screen. So it's a natural process. If we have, for example, out of 5,000 stocks, we get 50 or 60 stocks that come through that screen, we'll have a larger exposure to equities than if only a few can come through. Right. Meaning that stocks aren't able to meet a consistency of earnings screen or the lower on ROE, margins are not able to keep place, and maybe five or six other key ratios and fundamentals. So we utilize that for a core part of it, and then we use uh, a variety of technical indicators, some that we've built based on volume at price, uh, looking at what's called market profile, mm -hmm. and built these components. I think I sent you a few charts. Yes, we built did. these components to enable it, uh, me to find where the line in the sand is for ri uh, risk on the downside and upside. Combine that all together and utilize that uh, for a, uh, a strategy. That's perfect, perfect. And in the end, risk management is, is always yep. first and foremost right there. So That's let's correct. take a quick break. But to recap, the ind indices are back in an uptrend. Uh, but remember, the market is news sensitive. And also, we have become, uh, begun earnings season. So rem remain patient and let the market prove itself before getting too aggressive. When we return... We're going to talk about why you don't want to get ahead of the trade and start predicting in the market. Stay tuned. Hey guys, if you really enjoy listening to the podcast every week, we'd love it if you could rate and review the show on iTunes. Your review and ratings really help out the show and we would love to get your feedback. Thanks so much for listening. Andrew Horowitz is our guest on Investing with IBD. Okay, Andrew, let's get ahead and talk about not getting ahead of a trade and, uh, and really predicting the market. I mean, that's another important concept that everyone needs to learn. You, it, It's so easy to do all this research and you think that you have the holy grail, but mm -hmm. the market doesn't care of, uh, on your research. The market's just going to do what it wants to do, and it's up to all of us to really just listen to the market and go with the flow. You know, I think the one thing that I've learned on a stock by stock basis is love a stock as long as it loves you. Right. And that's all there is to that. The point here is I think that a lot of people try to look for reasons to, um, you know, really solidify what their basic bias is in terms of a stock. 
And if, or, or the markets for that matter, you know, I see all these bad things happening. And I had some people I recently talked to, some clients, and they were thinking about initially investing some money. And they said, you know, I really don't want to invest right now. I said, well, why is that? Well, you know, I really haven't uh, invested in a while. I think the market's at a top here. And, uh, you know, look for dips and, and, and look for opportunities. I think that's a reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. However, I said, well, what's your time frame? I mean, are we investing for the next two weeks? Because if that's the case, we're going to find a really good place to put some money to work. And then we'll close the position at the top of it, hopefully. And then, right. but is that really what you're doing? No, no, I'm investing for my retirement. Well, I said, if you're investing for your retirement, why do we have to worry about this exact point or that exact point on a market basis? Now, stocks are different. And when you think about that for a second, you really got to adjust your time frame to understand what is the most important part of what you're doing. Right. Are you investing for today or tomorrow or for the future? If you're investing for the future, the whole idea of trying to get ahead of something doesn't make any sense because what will happen invariably is if you are trying to wait for that dip, once that dip happens and the markets go down 20%, you're gonna say, uh-oh, I'm not investing here. Right. Markets look terrible. Right. So exactly. oftentimes when there's that point where you feel the most nauseous and the most upset and you say, I'm never gonna invest again, is oftentimes the best times to actually invest. Yeah, no, it, 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 makes, it makes a lot of sense. It's so funny with the, the dip part because we always hear that. If uh, you, you're always looking, you're always waiting for that great right. price. And then when that great price comes, I don't want right. it anymore. I don't want it. Yeah. I don't want it. To, it's no way. It's not, the stock looks terrible now. Exactly. And then right. on the other problem is, is that if you're in a strong market, you're waiting for a pullback that never comes to. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'll, right. I'll, I'll just keep waiting for a better price. And these, especially the stocks and the market, they'll, they'll just keep crawling away. And and, right. and so that's why it's so important to be be a disciplined investor and really just follow your plan. Right. And I think that the interesting thing is there's different ways for different people to invest. One of the things for IBD, I'm not going to speak for you, but you can confirm this is, hey, it's better to buy breakouts. Yes. Let's not try to buy anything that's falling down. If it's falling down, it's going for a reason. And let's look for a variety of different technical patterns. Right. Let's you know look at a, a breakout from a, from a long-term base, a cup and handle, whatever it may be, right? Yep. Whereas I think that you can actually play a little bit of a different game in, in addition to that. And what I like to see is I like to see opportunities to buy on very solid support if I can find a really hard volume support level and look at that as maybe playing an inside play between a consolidation zone, buy on the bottom, sell on the top, which obviously sounds easier than it is. Right. But you can buy that way too. So there's a couple of different ways to play the same game and it, it all depends on your particular desire. But at the end of the day, have a plan, write it down, stick to the plan. And when the plan comes to fruition with that exact price, act on the plan. Yes. And make sure you have an out, right? Make sure that it, it, the plan includes a stop price on the outside yeah. so you don't lose money. Yeah, so, and, and that's but, the biggest thing is that. But getting ahead of the trade is interesting because a lot of people will look in the future and see either, wow, you know, markets are coming down, but I think it's just temporary and I'm going to go buy in right now. Yeah. As opposed to waiting for it to base out and maybe look for the upturn on a good volume day and a follow through day said in your exactly. language. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or at, on the other side, wait for the market to signal it's rolling. Because if you actually took your money out of the market, let's say in 2005, where you thought really there could be a lot of problems in the market, you had to wait till 2007, eight for anything to actually play out. And right. you had two years of waiting and agony, and you could do a lot of pain mentally to yourself, whereas you won't be able to get back into something. Yeah, and and, and really 2006 and 2007, there were a number of windows to do really well in the markets during mm -hmm. those times, too. So yep. not, not getting ahead of yourself, trying to predict the markets, uh, you, you don't want to do that. You want to just listen to the market. When the market finally shows you signals, just listen to it, like 2007, 2008. A lot of people who were reading IBD at that point, me included, when I was a customer at that time, we just followed the rules, moved out of the market, uh, mm -hmm. there were the, and then for most of 2008, there wasn't anything to buy. There weren't those breakouts yep. happening at that None. time. And then it just kept getting worse and worse, and it got a lot worse than anyone could have imagined. But that's listening to the market. That's, listening, that's really following the trend. The only problem right now is the market is screaming at us every day. Yes. Because now versus 2008, we have Twitter and people telling you what's going on, whether it's high right. ranking officials or whether it's media. Yes. We have cross currents all over the place that are, I think, in my career since uh, going back to 1987, 88, 
I think it's the loudest screaming market of information, not good or bad, but just in a way confusing. Yeah. Of what's happening right now. Yeah. And and a, a big part is the cutting through the noise. Yeah. Right. A lot of times. I and I know you remember the flash crash in in, in 2010. Right. We we were all here. You know, as Scott O'Neill was uh, running Marksmith at that point, and yep. we we were all watching the markets. Also, the markets start started dropping, and especially the way they dropped. We don't have any TVs around, and and Twitter wasn't around at that point. Uh, I thought World War Three started with the uh, way the markets. Right. So I was like, what just happened? It's like how could the markets just drop like that? But right. we're, I was convinced that my systems were wrong, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I was convinced that something's not right with this whole thing. It looks like a giant stock split. Yeah. How does that happen? <laughs> exactly. exactly. So <laughs> so that's the thing. We, we, we In-house here, we go almost to an extreme of not following the news. And we're, we're usually going to be the last to know. We're just going to look at that price and volume. We're going to let the charts kind of tell us what to do. You know what else helps? And this is something that IBD teaches well. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a shill for IBD, but you know, great work, right? Yeah. You got to commend it when it's there. One of the things that's really great, and if you ever looked at a daily chart, just you know, a big screen daily chart, then go to look at IBD's weekly charts. If you elongate the candles, elongate the time frame that you're looking at, yeah, it tells a totally different picture than short term, you know, intraday or daily. Or, you know, it's a whole different thing. And if you could see a smoothing mechanism and you look at that and you take it back for a long period of time, like you do for all the charts on uh, the IBD 50, for example. Right. You look at that, pullbacks don't even look like a big deal. It is. So funny. I think it's yeah. important to, to, to exp you know, step back. Yes. Step back. Take a look at this from a much different perspective before you make a rash decision. Yeah. Yeah. And always look at the big picture, as, as you mentioned before uh, and and that rash decision is that's part of the plan right there. If you have a plan laid out, then that that noise is gonna and you actually follow the plan. That noise shouldn't have as much of a factor then, or all right. the noise on Twitter and stuff like that uh, doesn't have as much effect because you're following the plan. Uh, let's talk about an interesting trade that you made recently, and this is really and I, this is a great example because uh, when we were we were talking about this before. Uh, we, and we'll talk about this in the current mar and current stock section. But you asked, hey, could we could we show an example of a shorting stock? And usually, like, ah, oh, we we don't necessarily do that. But you know, in the end, I realized, you know, the market is a little bit more treacherous. A lot of growth stocks are doing very well, and in the end, you are following those trends right there. And so let's talk about one stock you shorted uh, recently, Planet Fitness. And, and mm -hmm. you're you're able to do uh, you capitalize on just by following the trend right there. So by the way, a short is just look at the same tools and techniques you use at IBD, turn the chart upside down, yep. and therefore what you have is the exact same rules to follow of a breakup or a breakdown, yep. right? Yep. So one of the things we we looked at was Planet Fitness. There was really going sideways for a while. There really wasn't a lot of um, action that I saw a couple of months back. And I looked at the stock from the perspective of that generally it has some good fundamentals. However, it really was not performing well. There was a variety of areas within that uh, stock chart that I looked at. I was looking at a daily stock chart that showed me kind of holes and areas of weak points, weak areas of support. Yep. So what we did is we waited for the stock to kind of climb up towards the 70 zone or so and looked at that as the opportunity to short. We thought the thesis behind it from a fundamental standpoint, if we were going to make a story out of it, was that, hey, what happens when all and if all these various companies like a Peloton or a Tonal or the Mirror yes. start really infiltrating the households and people say, you know what, we can run outside, I can use my Peloton, there's a lot of apps out there, maybe I don't want to go to the gym all the time, maybe there's uh, some issues with subscriptions if in fact we see the economy roll over and the stock started moving in our direction. And I looked at that and I said, you know what, when we get down past the approximately the 60 range, um, that's probably going to be my profit zone on it. Got down to, I think, about 50, what, 56 or so. Took it out at about 60 and then started bouncing back a little bit. Had an upgrade the other day, was up a few few points on that. Um, but it does, I mean, you look at that, I'm looking at the chart right now that you're showing me here. I mean, you see some triple tops there. You see a downward action. You have a downward sloping 50-day moving average. Things are not looking really that healthy for this stock. Fundamentally, it's strong. But otherwise, it doesn't really have a good look to it at all from a purely technical standpoint. Yeah, and, and I think a couple of other really interesting points, and you mentioned the, the triple top, uh, it, it, it really, you waited for a downtrend to truly be established first. 
where yeah. it started making lower lows and that 50 day moving average to actually be in a downtrend too. And that's right. when you act. You know, a lot of people, once again, a lot of people get ahead of the trade and they'll say, hey, there's Peloton out there, the mirror, all these things. I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to short it when the stock is in a, a strong uptrend. Right. You have to have that patience to finally see it on the chart and the price action to actually begin the downtrend, because a lot of people, right. they're always going to try to short at the top, buy at the bottom. But you're going to do really well if you wait for the trends to actually form and then start uh, acting on those trades. And yeah, like I said, it's exactly the same techniques you use for breakouts by turning the chart upside down. Same thing. Yeah, perfect. So remember, we always try to interpret the market and not predict. This way, you're not going to get caught flat-footed, and, and you also reduce the pressure of always having to be right. Coming up next, Andrew and I are going to talk about three stocks. We'll be back. Want to find stocks like the ones on this podcast? A lot of the best names we talk about come from IBD's exclusive stock lists, like the IBD 50 and the Big Cap 20. Whatever type of investor you are, we got a list for you. You can access every one of IBD's lists, plus stock ratings, exclusive analysis, and one-on-one -on -one coaching with a membership to IBD Digital. It costs less than a dollar a day, but for podcast listeners, we're offering an even better price. Go to Investors.com slash podcast offer right now and get your first two months for only $20. We are back with Andrew Horowitz. Okay, Andrew, let's talk about some current stocks that you are seeing in this market. And the first stock is Trade Desk. Trade mm -hmm. Desk, <laughs> ticker symbol TTD. And these guys are in the analytics space, advertising. And what they're they, essentially what they're doing is they've taken the power of algorithms and they've applied it to the advertising world to automatically connect buyers and sellers of ads as right. opposed to having agencies do it. So and they do it in a very fast manner. I mean, yeah. split second stuff going on. Exactly, exactly. And people can optimize it. And and really, if if uh, if if uh, one particular place where the advertising is not working, instantly they can switch to something else where they're right. really generating the revenue. Yep. So it's a great concept. They've been on the IBD fifty for quite a while. They've come up through our marksmith screens over the last couple of years. What do you see about this stock right now? So I think that the trade desk has fallen prey to some of the selling of growth names some of the names have come up a lot of profit taking going on here yeah. you can see that we saw that uh, last couple of months on that chart you know first of all a very smooth ride for a while there a couple yes. of chops here and there on some earnings misses some concern about you know of course at the end of the year last year but we started to see it roll over a little bit here recently um i think that right now you have a situation where a fundamentally strong company that in an environment that we're still seeing some decent advertiser spend go on and um, you know, keeping with the uh, fact that there's not a lot of competition in that space, that there is the opportunity for the stock to take a look at um, the potential for a bounce kind of in the 186 level is the downside level, but we did pick some of that up at that price. Okay. Looking at a 212 upside, did get to that point yesterday, by the way. Um, beyond that, I believe that we're gonna see that on November 7th, I believe is the next earnings that come out yeah November so short 6th, sellers could be have, seeing yeah. a little bit of a squeeze into that and uh you know again we're not predicting here but it does look like we're reaching a reasonable level of support that goes back sometime downside risk to 186 that's where our out is okay so so 186 would be your exit strategy that's uh, correct for, for, okay so so right now it's trading around 195 186 exit strategy so you're not giving too much that's like a five percent kind of right. stop which, which uh, and I think once again in the end it doesn't necessarily matter what strategy you're using as long as you have you're managing your risk and it's yeah. you know that that that's the the most important thing here right uh, and by the way one other thing uh, just a quick lesson if I may please. Uh, on on stops yeah so one of the things on stops a lot of people put in stops at round numbers so yes. when I say 186 we never put it in at 186 I mean there may be some rare occurrences we try to take it down a little bit because most people are actually playing those stops at those round numbers. And when they flush through that area, they come down even further, probably another 40, 50 cents on a stock this price, maybe even a dollar. Yeah. So we may be looking at actually something close to um, 185.48, getting away from the 50 round number, getting away from the round number of 186. So take it down about you know a point or or maybe a half a uh, half a point below that area to kind of keep away from those flushing areas that we see 
when you get below that important level of market profile based volume and price. I, I think that's an excellent, excellent point. And it, it, that's human nature, just to put it oh, at yeah. those, right? Or even if you're right. looking at a stock chart and the, you look at a reasonable place, hey, if it undercuts this other previous support area, that's where I'm going to put the stop. Everyone else is putting their stop right. in, and you get that exactly super that. flush, right? right? Uh, now, what about staggering stops? Do you, you, do you place all your shares at one stop price or are you uh, going to stagger them? How, how, do you, how do you generally do that? So sometimes on the way out of a profit zone, if a stock is moving above an area or holding on an area and we want to take some profit, I may take out part of the position and hold it back and wait for it maybe to get above another level if it does. Yeah. But from a risk management standpoint, you know what? There's nothing like taking a profit. Yes. Let's take the profit. Let's bank it. And then we'll see what the rest does. On the downside, though, you know what? Sometimes it does, in fact, move in the direction. It does get stopped out and bounces back up. I know that happens. Right. On the other hand, there's plenty of times when our stop, maybe a day later, it's higher, but then it continues down lower. That happened recently with Zoom Media, ZM. We were uh, looking at that stock, traded it back and forth a few different times. And then when it undercut our stop, it came back a little bit that same day. And I'm like, uh-oh. Did we do this wrong? Yeah. And then, you know what? It continued down another 4 or 5% after that. You know, and and, and and say say what if you did it wrong? Say say what if it went up without you? Big deal, right? I mean, in the end, yep. you have to manage your risk because we're always trying to avoid those events where they continue to go much lower and, and those are kind of the portfolio-destroying events out there. Yeah, absolutely. There's plenty of stocks. Plenty of stocks to play with. Plenty of stocks to invest in. Uh, plenty of stocks to trade. Let's go to the second stock here, and this is a short, and this is a stock everyone knows, Facebook. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm going to get some hate mail. Hate mail's coming. So, so the thing on Facebook is, again, a tight range on this, but the story and the fundamental story is this, that the company has been for some time really projecting the idea that they're spending a lot of money, that their revenues are going to be down uh, potentially, but their earnings are going to be down even more sub uh, substantially due to the fact that they are doing a massive spend to try to keep away the bad things that seem to happen at Facebook. <laughs> and they have a lot of security going on there. I don't know what's going to happen. You may say, well, Andrew, you're entering into a massive political spend cycle. And Facebook That's has true, said yeah. they don't care. They're going to allow it. Other companies are not going to maybe allow it. The fact is that I, I listened and I agree with that. I find that the other part of this problem is potentially going to be and how it's going to really cause a problem is the incredible regulatory hangover. One of the things that really sparked my attention was when Mark Zuckerberg went in front of the Congress and he asked them for help. Who does that? <laughs> Why would you ask Congress for help in cleaning up a problem that they're so against? Gave them basically an open door to come out and do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Now they have the Libra situation that has uh, been right. thought of as this great opportunity. Major players like Stripe and PayPal and MasterCard are out of it. It left a good number of other players in there, some VCs. Um, and some other investors in, in this area. But it doesn't look as strong. Uh, many countries around the world have vowed to really be significantly uh, opposed to this and have tight regulation. And the reason why some of these companies left was because of the regulatory environment. So, Andrew, so, let, let's, let me hold you uh, for one second there. Let, let's go over Libra just for those who are a little bit newer. Uh, Libra is um, – it, it's multifaceted. But basically, well, the layperson, what the, the average – I think person on the street thinks it's just another cryptocurrency. Right. It is going to be a cryptocurrency style uh, or, or usage as an alternative currency. That's a better way to look at it. Okay. That since Facebook has all this access to all their members across countries around the world, that this would be a paying platform to be utilized for a whole host of things, inclusive of banking, inclusive of credit, inclusive of loans, payment for things on Instagram where they're going to have, you know, you see a, a great, you know, beautiful dress and you're like, I love that. Click that button, pay with it yeah. with Libra. Yeah. And it would be cross currency, not a problem where you have to worry about, well, I got to convert this to Euro. I got to convert this to the yen. It's going to be very easy. That's a, that's a taste of it. But basically yeah. the concern is that, I mean, I have a concern with Facebook knowing even more information about Seriously, me. Seriously. Yeah. OK, yeah. that's my personal concern. But I think there's a lot of concern about other countries around the world and they worry about if this could weaken their currency. And they're already seeing a lot of problems in the cryptocurrency space aside and the concern about being able to track this and what other illegal purposes 
money laundering can be utilized with this. So um, I, I'm not a big fan of this. I'm a, I'm a you know, a old style, let's just state of the dollar, state of the euro, state of the whatever the currency is. If it's a problem dealing with it, just play with, pay with a credit card because that's credit cards are an alternative currency, aren't they? True, true. Yeah. You go around, go, go everywhere around the world, and you can you can pay with a credit card, and and I have and done it, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, and and it works quite well. Right. Um. So so let's get into the the technicals that you see with uh, Facebook, and and giving some reason, uh, what why why you think this might be a short. So so Facebook is starting to see a fifty day moving average starting to roll over. Is that your red line it's starting to kind yes. of come down? Still not an absolute level on the downside. You do have this weird head and shoulder patterns, which you know sometimes play out and sometimes don't. If you have the basic numbers, you're probably coming down to that lower point that you have, what is that, in January is the downside uh, point. We have a number that, you know, we're looking at a range that Facebook is actually trading in, uh, which you can see very easily on any chart, about 180 to 190. Yep. Uh, if, the, if the stock stumbles, and it gets below 175, there's really nothing there from a volume-based uh, process that we, so in other words, we calculate every trade, every piece of volume, look at that and say, okay, well, where's the volume at price being traded? Yeah. Put that on a chart on a daily basis, under 175, you have a real problem. We call it a hole or a fast zone yeah. where you have um, horizontally quick moves through time. Yeah. And uh, 175 is really the number on the downside. You may have to put up a little pain because everybody loves Facebook like they love the banks. You know, it's just one of the things that everybody has in every portfolio. Yeah. But the warnings and combined with all the things that are going on, privacy issues, big concern. Excellent. Okay, let's go to the last stock. This is Luckin Coffee, uh, the Chinese uh, the Chinese coffee place, the, essentially competing with Starbucks. Right. Um, and they came out, what, a year or so ago. Uh, an exciting IPO, but um, what what do you see with these guys right now? So this this is a more of a, a long kind of idea that that you're looking at right now. This is a, this is a long position, although we've traded this and it trades really well through about uh, the high 18s through 21. Uh, now, obviously, it doesn't have a lot of of uh, actual history on here, but um, one of the things that's kind of interesting if you understand what's happening in the dynamic with this whole trade war, this trade kerfuffle, this fight, this yeah. skirmish, yeah. whatever you want to call it, <laughs> is that there is a lot of anti-American sentiment that's happening in China. And Starbucks recently really infiltrated that area. Yes. And with all of this brewing, uh, the fact is that what you're going to see, I think, is the potential for all these uh, Chinese people who now are enjoying their coffee, maybe taking a little, you know what, I'm going to buy Chinese sentiment, and Luckin Coffee has that opportunity. They're really expanding dramatically. Uh, they have beautiful stores all throughout China. The stock itself, if it does get above the 21 range, you have a really great opportunity for a breakout on the upside. Again, down below the 18 is kind of a no touch zone. That's a real concerning area. Um, but you can play the range. It's been, if you can see the last moves, um, I can't see that exactly well in your chart, but about 1850 to about 21 is kind of those key points that we look for trading in between. $18 oh. on the downside is a stop. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you, you can see that when you're looking on the, on the daily chart here. Uh, uh, pretty well, and I think that that anti-American kind of sentiment that that's a really really interesting point uh, but what's, of especially what's going on in, in China and uh, uh, people just really take may, maybe making Starbucks pay by going yep. to Luck and Coffee. Mm -hmm. So there are three stocks for you to consider. Now remember, the most important thing is to manage your risk. Thanks, Andrew, for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Great stuff. Appreciate it. That's it for this week on Investing with IBD. Next week, we will have Scott St. Clair return to the podcast. He is a senior product coach and national speaker for MarketSmith. So that's it. I'm Arusha Pierce, and thanks for listening. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to Investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode.